Hello everyone, welcome to eLearn Chat, where you always learn something new, and today will be no exception. We've got with us Leslie Price. She's coming to us from just outside London, and she runs pretty much learnappeal.org.uk. It's a great charity. Do check them out. That's learnappeal.org.uk. And we've got Harold Muliati. He is our video producer. He's about 10 feet away from me right now. Our guest today is a very good friend, somebody that we were talking earlier. We miss each other. We haven't seen each other in a while. Uh, he and his wife are just great folks. And his name, he's been on the show before. Ajay Pangarkar, who is probably one of the smartest people in e-learning you'll ever meet. And uh, my name is Rick Zanotti. I'm with Relay Corporation. And here we go. This show is sponsored by Relay Corporation. Digital learning development, media development, corporate video, management consulting, and more. Visit us at www.relate.com. Thanks. And we are back and in that center position of power, absolute power. It's Ajay Pangankar. Ajay, how are you? I am doing well, Rick. It's great to see you with us again. I always enjoy being here with both of you. It's always like it's like a, a wonderful smart sandwich right now. It's fantastic. <laughs> that sounds great. Now we miss you too. Like we were talking about, we had dinner about a year ago when you were out here for uh, Lynda.com or for LinkedIn Learning, and um, that was fun. We had a great dinner, and it was it's good seeing you and Terry, your wife, and and I think you folks probably remember he's Ajay's been on the show before. His wife Terry and Leslie are actually somewhat possibly related. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the of, of both so of the Scottish descent. Yes. So yeah, her, her her maiden name is uh, Kirkwood, uh, and her grandfather was from. Uh, he's not even Canadian. He was, he's, he's, he was Scottish. He came from Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got corrected there earlier, so I'm the bad Canadian. <laughs> um, and and of course, uh, she's got Scottish lineage, so she's always yeah. curious if she's related to Sean Connery or Daniel Craig or somebody or other. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, for all those who don't know, Sean Connery passed away last week. And I, I love Sean Connery. He was a good actor. He seemed like a really good guy. And, you know, we were talking about this. Why Why do we feel so attached to actors now where we never used to? I think our whole generation grew up with actors. We grew up watching movies. We grew up, So it's almost like they become part of your extended family. And when they go, and especially if you've enjoyed their movies or who they were, it was, it was really good. It was fun. I still think he was probably the best Bond out there. Nobody Absolutely. was as good a Bond as he was. Though I do like Daniel Craig. He's not too bad at it. Very different. But, he, but he's not bad either at it. Though I've only seen, I think, one of them. Um, well, anyway, let's get to, to the topic at hand, and that's <laughs> Ajay. Uh, so how, how, how have you been? How have you been doing with, you know, doing, we're all shut down doing. or we can't travel much. And I know you like to travel. We like to travel. Nobody's gone anywhere. Um, I think well, about you know, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, you know, the traveling thing is actually gets kind of old after a while. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as when you travel as much as we all of us do here on, on this uh, on this set right now, it, it's kind of nice to have that little break and, and going from city to city just for the uh, you know, conferences and for the and for the work. It, it's nice to do it virtually. To be honest with you, I really mm. kind of enjoy having this virtual element. Yeah, well, that's true. If you do fly, flying isn't as much fun as it used to be. 20 years ago, flying was better. Lately, it hasn't been that much fun. They cram you into planes, and it's just not all that pleasant. Um, I, was, I was watching one guy the other day who was complaining about he flew from, I think it was New York to uh, Miami, and he went for his class, and they served him a little plastic bag with chips, and he goes, I paid for his class for this garbage. <laughs> and I started laughing because I guess because of COVID, it can't give you any real food. <laughs> So it's all plasticized, and it's just like, yeah, at first isn't what it used my, to be, I last, guess. Uh, my last memorable trip, to be honest with you, was uh, in 2018 when I got a chance to go to England, UK, mm -hmm. uh, for LTUK. And I got to finally meet Leslie in person. It was a huge hug. It was wonderful. Yeah. And then got later that year, I got the keynote at, uh, in Australia. So uh, nice. two wonderful, wonderful memories. Yeah, that is good. So, so Ajay, today you were going to talk about 
a couple, you had a whole mess of topics in mind, and, and we were saying, let's, let's yeah. stick with the five steps. Now, what were the five steps you wanted to talk about? So um, I've been, I'm a sort of an armchair student of strategy. I mean, my background, as you know, is, is, is in the business side of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, my my, my degree is in finance. I focus on performance management and strategy, and I went on to do an accounting degree. And, of course, I, I am a fellow to the Chartered Professional Accountants in Canada. And uh, But I've always had this love of strategy and how companies work to achieve their objectives. Mm-hmm. And so uh, for what bugged me for a long time is the evolution of strategy and how we're looking at strategy within organizations. Now, I know your audience is probably saying to themselves, well, what's that got to do with learning? Oh, we'll get to that in a minute. But the five steps of strategy is how the leading companies that we see today do not look at strategy the way you and I were taught in school, mm-hmm. the linear approach. There's a very different perspective on that, and I've documented that with, this, with CPA Canada in a, a research period paper um, called Rethinking Organizational Strategy, and it, it speaks to the five key steps in that area, that, that how they follow it. So before you get in, let me ask you a quick question. Is today's day and age better, worse, or just different? I, I think it's, I, if you ask my opinion, I believe it's better, but for sure it's different. Um, and I'll, I'll share this with you very succinctly because I know it can get uh, the papers. By the way, the, the research paper from CPA Canada is free for anybody to download, so there's no charge to it. And I encourage you, uh, if, as professional development reading, uh, just for your own purpose, especially if you're in learning, to understand how an organization works. Um, and I'm going to speak to that in just a second. But to understand that strategic alignment is key because when I say it's better, is because companies today are under a lot of stress and a lot of competition to gain market access and to survive, especially in what we're living in throughout in this world right now as far as the pandemic goes. You know, it, it speaks to the, f- the fact that the healthy companies who know how to act or, or act on their access or their, their objectives are surviving significantly. And when we look at the top companies in the world, when I say, and they're, they're, they're apparent for a reason, by the way. So when you talk about like the, the common names that we hear all the time, the Starbucks, the Apples, whatever, uh, you know, the Amazons, these companies look at the value they offer to the market, not the products or services that they're marketing to the market, which is a very significant shift in how you look at strategy. Well, but, yeah. You say it's different, RJ, but when I was at university, and I'm going back to, you know, the 1970s, I actually studied um, business economics and marketing. And one of the things that we and and the two subjects, believe it or not, the university it was at Strathclyde University in Glasgow, and it was a very, very, very forward thinking university. It was one of the first universities in Europe to offer marketing as a degree. So it was, you know, and it but it was linked in to business strategy, business economics. And so I was doing this however many years ago, and that's certainly when I then went into teaching and lecturing in universities and community colleges, that's what I taught. What, what, what you're talking about there is actually what I taught at um, HND undergraduate degree level back in the mid to late 1980s. No, and to your point, Leslie, and I was, I was going to say, you know, 70s, that's impossible. I, I figure it was like maybe late 90s that you graduated from university. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, uh, I graduated in all fairness, from university you know, universities nine, at that 1979. Point, oh, fantastic. <laughs> that's, you know, you still, you still don't look that. So, you know, I, I look older than you probably at this point. <laughs> but... Uh, the university, if your university was doing that, that's actually pretty progressive because the standard approach yeah. back then was, as, as we all understand, competition was relatively limited, right? I mean, look at, I use the automotive industry, you know, up till into the 70s, there was really only three major players um, in, that dominated 90% of the market. And so when you have that limitation of competition, you have the luxury of not just resting on your laurels and being complacent about it and and just you know well we just we can just make any product and they'll buy it and so strategy is not wasn't as important in the sense that 
it wasn't seen as it was important, but it wasn't seen as a priority. Now, when you have a significant competition, so it's still taking the auto industry. You know, they it expanded into many very progressive companies um, that have taken leadership in the market and put the American car companies on notice several times in these 80s and then in the 90s and then of course you know in the, in the, in the 2000 three times these companies almost went bankrupt and for some reason they didn't learn a lesson but it showed where companies actually decided rather than looking at end objectives look at the value they offer offer not give you an example Toyota uh, is a company in that space that early on you know 40 50 years ago it is the value of quality. Now today we take quality as you know, agnostic, something that everybody has to do. Back then, when you had a GM or Ford or Chrysler offering you to what we call collector items today, but were basically lemons back then, um, and then offering a very quality product, and and they become equivalent to you know when you look up the word equality in cars, you think Toyota, and they even leverage that. But it, they don't make the most exciting cars. But people who buy that car recognize that it will last, you know, you know, two hundred thousand miles or four hundred thousand miles as a commercial show. Uh, whether it be true or not, that's another issue. And I, I, I believe it's true because it wouldn't be around that long if their value wasn't succinct. But it just shows that there's a value proposition that has to take place. And there was a great article, and I encourage people to read this article. It was by. Um, Oh, it will escape me the names now, of course, because I'm on air. But the title of the article is Customer Intimacy and Other Value Disciplines. And it was written in the 90s uh, by two authors, uh, Wirzema and Tracy. And both of these individuals surmise that the com companies build, successful companies will build themselves around three core value propositions. And, and that's what the successful companies have been doing in the last 20, 30 years. Well, yeah, if you look at something we like... Just, at the university <laughs> I went to, we were just very, very lucky in that the, the person that was the professor in marketing actually um, went on. I mean, he, he, you know, he then became the emeritus, you know, professor because he went on to head up the Chartered Institute of Marketing in the UK. So it was very, very, very forward thinking. And even the building... Yeah that we were in, the university building we were in, was a new building that was built. Um, it was actually founded by um, when the person who ran the company that my dad used to work for, when he died, um, he left money to education. And they built this fantastic uh, building, which had all mod cons and everything in it. So really good lecture theatres, really good classrooms, very easy to get around. Um, so the whole thing was actually designed around student learning, but not just student learning on their own and not sitting in the old fashioned, remember the old fashioned tiered yeah. lecture theatres? Yeah. Our, these lecture theatres were not like that. <laughs> they they weren't built that way. So I think we were just very, very lucky that we had very, well, not only a forward-thinking lecturers, but very forward-thinking um, people who ran the whole university. Well, you know, getting, and that's getting... largely, and you're right, Leslie, it's <laughs> largely to the value the university wanted to deliver to, quote-unquote, the customer, the student. And, and yeah. it, it said that we don't have to Form, keep ourselves in that stereotypical um, um, perception of what we have of academia. We can do it differently and offer a tremendous yeah. amount of value. And that speaks largely to the corporate world right now. So when you look at successful companies, I, I use Starbucks a lot as an example. You know, the purpose of Starbucks, and they know this, is not to sell coffee. It's to sell an experience. And that experience, when you go to Starbucks and you explicitly choose Starbucks, and, and granted, I go to Starbucks and I love their coffee, but people typically go there is because there is a brand and a value around it to that you associate yourself with, and they're so successful um, that you know when you think of specialty coffee these days around the world, even though Europe had it for the longest time before it was mass marketed, and even parts of Canada. Um, today, we just equate that with a Starbucks uh, uh, environment. Now, here's the interesting thing. What does this have to do with learning? And people ask me that question. I said, well, if I was in learning 
in, in L and D at Starbucks, I guarantee you one thing: they know where to focus their efforts to reinforce that value proposition, and they know to keep performance metrics to reinforce that to make sure that Starbucks is always on the leading edge. And people say, "Well, how can you give me a concrete example?" I said, "Okay, next time you're in Starbucks, do me one favor." And I will even give you the five or ten bucks to buy the, their expensive coffees. I said, but here, do me one favor. I said, get your coffee and then customize the crap out of it. And I said, do it a couple of times at different Starbucks. Now, I say, you can go to the UK and order at Starbucks that same coffee. You can go to Italy and order that same coffee at Starbucks. You can go to anywhere in the US or Canada, for that matter, and order the same coffee. And the coffee is consistent. And three minutes later, it's at the end of the counter with your name spelled wrong on it. <laughs> the point being is that, you know, maybe they do any training and name, code, but the point being is that that's driven by learning. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, it, <clears throat> it blows my mind. Oh, no, I 100% I, I agree with you because I used to say this to, you know, when I was teaching marketing undergraduate level, um, I used to say to them, one of the things you need to do, it is constantly about learning. And the same thing applies to the senior management in the company, that they also have to learn because things change, times change. And if you don't keep your senior management in the learning loop as well, then you know, what is the point? And, and people used to say, oh, but how can, you know, senior managers, you know, our directors won't want to learn. I say, well, more fool them. Yeah. Now, getting back to <laughs> strategy a little bit, when you were talking about strategy, um, <clears throat> what, what was, was that the fifth point, when, what you were talking about, or the first point? So uh, I'll, I'll step back. and I've been <laughs> too far. Back. Well, you know, Rick, you know, you just get me going with all this wonderful stuff so uh, I, I'll, I'll lay the blame on you my dear friend uh, but no, I'm just kidding um, <laughs> the first step is to determine what uh, you know you have to re as a company it, it starts with leadership as Leslie mentioned and it really speaks to the fact that they have to understand who they are and what they want to be and that has to be defined very clearly but rather than being defined as what type of products we make it's about what kind of value do we want to bring into the marketplace which is a, a shift in mindset because the traditional strategic planning process is, well, here are the products and we want to best, be best at making this product. I'm you know, light about it, but that was typically the traditional approach. The, now the, the progressive companies are saying, no, you know, Apple doesn't sell iPhones. They sell, you know, a way to, you know, have your life being brought around in your hand at any given point in time. I mean, they're, they're not selling the iPhone. They're selling the experience. And the value that the iPhone delivers, and that's and people. I know they, a lot of people don't appreciate the shift of this thought, but it's very significant. And once they get that thought process in place, then all the pieces fall in the line because the second step, they have to ex sort of operationalize this, and they go back to their value chain. And the value chain, if anybody doesn't really know what the value chain is, it was it was created by Michael Porter, um, a, a famous strategist economist from Harvard who created the value chain of every company. And in that value chain, we can find a focus area to align our new mission and our new strategy. And it's in those value chain areas that they put the most emphasis. So for example, the part of value chain of, of, of creating coffee at Starbucks is at that, that point of value chain where the customer is ordering and delivering to, uh, the, the sort of barista is delivering it to the customer. And that's where most of the emphasis is in when it comes to developing processes uh, comes to develop supporting the learning and execution and learning. It comes to the marketing. It comes to everything. All those elements fit in that area. The rest of the value chain is is operational, but it's not the focus of that company. So you know, use Amazon. It's a different value focus area. It's a supply chain. You know, it's the back end that they focus on as their value. Um, and so, every company focuses on different areas of value chain who are successful. And that's the next step. And then from that, when you know the emphasis areas in the value chain that you need to focus on all those key elements, you can then create or they create the key performance indicators that are focused and targeted. And that's the needle learning has to tie into, right? That's if, <coughs> if it's about delivering a coffee within three minutes accurate every single time around the world, doesn't matter, you know, where you order it. 
So there are performance indicators tied around that. And if I was learning in development, and I guarantee you, I guarantee you, and I wish somebody would start, you know, send me a note, but I guarantee you the senior learning manager, sorry, the senior directors at Starbucks and the learning department are partners. Mm -hmm. It's not an afterthought. This is a symbiotic relationship. This is something that's tied in very closely. And they work very closely together. And learning and development there, I guarantee is looking at key performance metrics that they need to help affect uh, as they move on. And then eventually you have to look at things like risk management and the strategy, how to make sure you mitigate the risk. And finally, always keeping that, the fifth step is always keeping that value focus fresh and evolved as you move on. Process. You know, it's interesting you bring up the, the key KPIs or key performance indicators because I will guarantee you that 8 out of 10, if not more, e-learning or training people don't know what a KPI is. And they, they've never heard that. Uh, I've, I know some people. I've, given a, I've actually given gifts of your book, the, the Balance Scorecard book, to more than one <laughs> director of training who had no idea what a KPI was, who had no idea. They would tell you something like, I've trained 10,000 people this year. And what performance increase did you have? Uh, uh, well, I, I trained 10,000 people. I don't care. That's meaningless. What, how did they improve their training? How are they better? What have they done to improve? Uh, what key performance indicators? That? What's a KPI? What's a key performance? So, so they're, they're running organizations where they don't even know why they're run, other than, I trained 20,000 people. Well, what good is who that? Cares? Yeah, who cares? That's just numbers. How did the company benefit? Yeah. And so, you know, parting from that premise, that's a lot of training you've got to do to get somebody up to speed on what a KPI is, what's important, why it's important, and, and how do you make a company improve performance? Like you were talking about Starbucks, which is not one of my favorites, but uh, I just don't like their coffee. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, if you want really good coffee, go, go find Meinl. Julius Meinl, M-E-I-N-L. It's Austrian. Oh, some of the best coffee in the world. They're incredible. They're probably up in Canada, too. It's good. Um, very, very good. But no, how do you, you know, the guys at Starbucks probably say, hey, in order to get that value proposition going, we need to know what we're trying to accomplish, what indicators we're trying to, to make better. We, okay, it's taking three minutes to get the coffee. What if we can get that down to two? How do we do yeah. that? How do we get people to check you out more quickly? Do we need better machines? Do we need better people? Do we need better customers? You know, sorry, you're a lousy customer. Get lost. Okay, you, you, you order quickly. We'll keep you. Uh, I mean, all of those things are really what companies look at. How do we look at this? And strategically, I think to your point, it, everything changed over the last 20 years. The speed of change is, I think, tenfold, if not more, what it used to be Back in the 70s, 80s, even early in 90s, we're way slower. Yeah. The engineering process now is, is many times months instead of years. Big difference. So there's a, there's a lot of, you know, a lot to unpack, and you said a lot of valuable things, Rick. Uh, but if, I'll, I'll try to make this, you know, just sing for, for the audience a little bit. So one is you're right about the KPIs. Um, and I hate to say this, and I'm going to ruffle a lot of feathers by saying this, but it's L and D's own fault for their own, yeah. um, their own, their own uh, demise. In the sense that when I always said to people, you know, don't complain to me when you say your L and D budget got cut, mm -hmm. because as a business person, I know for a fact that whenever money's put in a business anywhere, it has to drive value. And what these stakeholders are saying to you is that you haven't shown us any value, so we're taking our money and putting it elsewhere that's mm -hmm. going to give us value. So take responsibility of why you're not driving value to your point about the 10,000 people being trained. And I don't say who cares in, 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 a, in a sarcastic or facetious mindset. It is actually a question that your stakeholders are asking. If you say to them, I've trained 10,000 people, they're going to go, so what? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And it's not to be mean spirited. It is about give me the validation of what relevancy that has on making this business better. And training people is not the end result. It's the vehicle to get us the end result. It's not about learning. It's about actually doing. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. And when you get the KPIs, that's the other fault line that we have in learning is that we tend to Here's a couple of things I've seen in my 20 plus years of experience. One, either companies, uh, sorry, uh, L&D creates their own performance metrics. And I'm like, 
why are you venting? One, your stakeholders are not going to take, see any credibility in it because mm-hmm. it's yours. It's not theirs. You're supposed to be changing their world, not your own world. Mm-hmm. And number two, they've already created performance indicators that they want to move. And these performance and, and performance is that when we talk about learning, it's a better moving performance. And the third thing is that if we move those performance indicators, uh, we will show, we'll prove our value. That's if you want to talk about ROI, that's where the ROI lies, not on paying back what we spent on training. It's about indirectly the causal relationship of creating a better performance so we can move to performance indicators. Mm-hmm. Now, and the fourth one, and I'll, I'll end at this point so you can have a word in edgewise for me, but the, the fourth point is learning is never, uh, so let me back up a step here. When strategy is up here, right, and then we operationalize that strategy down here, and when we operationalize it, we, we're putting it into play. We're actually implementing it into the granular daily activities that happen in an organization. So things like operational processes, let's take the Starbucks example. When they're delivering the coffee in three minutes, it's not because of the learning that that happens. It's because how, number one, how Starbucks has organized the process workflow in each store and then learning layers on top of it to make sure that on that process workflow, people know what to do and how to do it properly and, and delivers that coffee in three minutes. So we're not alone and we're the enabler, not the driver. So we have to respect our roles and respect the fact of what people want from us. And that's basically all that you have <laughs> a few words in that choice. But there's here. also, <laughs> but don't you think, Ajay, there's also got to be a driver for the people who are learning. So I talk about the WIFM, the what's in it for me. So there has to be, you know, if you're even if you're just talking about Starbucks, the, the people who are doing the learning, the people who are actually making the coffee, the people who are doing the serving, the people who are on the front line, they've also got to see some kind of benefit over why they're learning. You know, what is the WIFM? What's the what's in it for me? Otherwise, they, there's not really any incentive. And threatening people with their job, you know, saying, oh, well, if you don't do it, you're out in your ear. That is not a particularly positive incentive. It's a negative. It's a threat rather than yeah. an incentive, if that makes sense. It's the, it's the stick rather than the carrot, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Leslie, I concur. I mean, listen, and that's where I was going, you know, I think we're talking about the same thing just from different perspectives. The incentive here is that the what's in it for me for the learner is that it, it really not ha- it doesn't really have to do with learning. It has to deal with the reward and performance reward systems within the organization. Yeah. So those incentives that we tie, if, if I help, say, Leslie, you're the barista, and, and the what's in it for you as a barista, and I'm training you in these concepts or process flows, if, if your incentive is to make sure the coffee is done well, accurate, and within three minutes or less to the customer, and you're rewarded for that, then you are going to be driven to make sure that I'm teaching you the right things. And um, from a learning perspective, from my perspective, I, I can target exactly what you need to learn to make you better. So yeah. there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's a key relationship. So to your point, there has to be that carrot at the end of it um, to make sure people uh, capitalize. But again, again, this is not... And I'm going to say this very generically, okay? Please, so please don't try to paint me in the corner on this one. But very generically, this is more a um, a decision um, and a um, it's a decision and a role for senior or leadership to set up the appropriate appropriate performance incentives within the organization. It's not laid yeah. on the backs of uh, responsibility of learning um, because we are just one cog in the, in the great wheel of the organization. Yeah, and, and, and so. <clears throat> And, and to Leslie's point, you know, the what's in it for me also, if you're in a customer centric organization like Starbucks, where ultimately the customer is who they're trying to please, that so the what's in it for me is not just what they're learning to be better at their jobs, but are you getting a smile of that customer as they're leaving? Are you getting that customer to come back? So what's in it for yep. me is you may get better tips, you may get a happy customer, you may get repeat business, they'll know who you are, they'll ask for you, or whatever. The, it, it could yep. be an incentive for them, and and that's something that's so often forgotten in training. You know, it's not yep. the learning that counts, and this is what Leslie said earlier. It's what do you do with it, and how does that benefit where it's going? Whether it's a customer, whether it's another department, whether it's a patient. Mm-hmm. You know, 
how how is that making life better for whomever you're doing it for? Yeah, this speaks largely to that value proposition aspect I was telling you about. Because you know you talk about customer centric, but let's work with um, in Amazon mm-hmm. or FedEx, right? The, the satisfaction of customers, couple of things, right? Let's work with FedEx and get it out from the common ones all the time, or UPS. The, the, the satisfaction of the customer is to get their packages as fast as possible in the time promised. And of course, undamaged and well cared for, right? So, the what's in it for me for those workers and the on the and the, the inside is to make sure that they are able to move that product that that package throughout the process very quickly, but not at not at the expense of the quality of the package, so the customer is happy, right? So, there's a couple of factors here in that what's in it for them. So, if I'm training in UPS then those are my value propositions that I have to target into what's in it for me. And it speaks of key performance indicators. So the what's in it for me for the persons at UPS or, or FedEx learning about these skill set is that, number one, I can help move improve the performance. So rather than take a day to get maybe it can take a half a day to get it. Um, and the box is not damaged or whatever it may be. And the second is I'm rewarded for that, right? Again, it goes back to that what is in it for me. If I'm doing my job better because I've learned stuff and able to apply those skills, I've not only moved the, the performance indicator, but now I'm being rewarded for doing that. And it's, again, not just our responsibility. I want the L&D people to realize that I'm in their corner. But do not take on the weight of the world on you because the organization is just that. It's a, The word organization means it's a sum of all parts. And you, we're just one of those parts. You know, one thing that we're not talking about that much anymore, at least societally, I, I haven't heard much about this. People for a, a long time were talking about UX, the user experience. I'm not sure what it's being replaced by right now, but I don't hear UX that much anymore. Um, it could be me. But if if you think about it, the UX is such a complex thing, and all the companies like Amazon have to look at Amazon reviews. Five, 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 one. And the guy with the one says, I didn't get my product shipped well. <laughs> well, what does that have to do with the product? And that's the user experience. One thing in that user experience can destroy the whole experience. Amazon might do a great job. They've got great warehousing, great packaging, great shipping. And then it it arrives a day late because UPS screwed up or the post office screwed up. And then they blame Amazon and the product for it, which is unfortunately that happens all the time. That's why a lot of times nobody pays attention to the ones because there's some of the stupidest reasons why something, what product wasn't any good, had nothing to do with the product. But the user experience is also key in training because you may be teaching something and then that person goes off and does it wrong and now they're getting blamed or they're blaming the company for something that was maybe taught wrong. So again, as, as L&D people, you've got to keep in mind you're part of that user experience. At one point in that chain, you're, you could get blamed as much as anybody else, and usually it's not you, but it may come back to you as people start auditing and saying, wait a minute, why? Here you weren't taught right, or this wasn't right, and, and all of a sudden then L&D gets whacked again because they're not even auditing their own processes sometimes. Um, but it is interesting, just you know, the UX of how everything ties together. It's kind of that synergistic approach of things. Well, that. That's wonderful. Rick. I mean, that's it, no. It speaks volumes to um, our role in the organization. Yeah. Uh, I guess, unfortunately, unfortunately, I get to work with a lot of progressive organizations. I always tell people in there that you know, I don't know why you're bringing me in. You're doing the right things, mm. but yeah. I guess they want to do more right things. But anyways, um, it's you know, we're really addressing the the, the other ninety percent of organizations that are not putting the right things, and that user experience is very very important uh, because it, it speaks volumes to. Again, how we're bringing the learning to light, how we're really getting to execute. Because remember, I always say learning is a business function within a business to help de- deliver business results. Yep. And the common word here is business. So we are simply the vehicle to do that. And that part of that user experience is all the way through. And if I can extend that thought, Rick, your, your thought is excellent. Because the user experience also means not necessarily, I know it's become less and less, but not necessarily having to drag somebody out of their workplace, whether it be put in an instructor-led classroom or to sit before a computer for two, three, four, or five hours. That's poor user experience on learning. If, if you're L&D and still doing that, shame on you. Because at the end of the day, you're supposed to, allow, that user experience has allowed that, that, that employee 
to acquire the learning in a way that's most relevant and convenient for them. And I speak about this in one of my lean learning uh, uh, session, which speaks to all the technology we beg for in learning. But I always say, I say to L&D people, be careful what you wish for because that technology is a double-edged sword. From the leader's perspective, they say you want technology. You're telling me you want to become more efficient, save money, become more effective. And if you're not using those technologies that way, you know why are you asking for it? And so that user experience is very is very uh, well founded, Rick. Yeah. Now, Leslie, you've done a lot of that when you were managing and teaching. How did, how did you find the user experience? Did it ever come back to you to your department of whether something was good or bad or indifferent? Did you ever get the feedback? Yeah, all the time. All the time. So that's good. But we had the college where I did um, the college where I did most of my teaching had a really fantastic what they called pastoral system mm. for students. Mm -hmm. So we had a really, really great system. So even though we were teaching students at, um, you know, higher national diploma, first year undergraduate level, they still, one, one session a week, they had um, what they call what they called a group tutorial, so they were put into you know groups of about twenty, and then even within that we were allocated time, so that you know maybe once a month we would individually meet with every single learner, every single learner, for at least ten to fifteen minutes. So we had that system in place and we were one of the very, very, very few colleges at the time, community colleges, that had that kind hmm. of system. And it, because the, the lecturers, the teachers, they wanted feedback. They, they, because they couldn't get better unless they had the feedback and sometimes mm -hmm. you wanted the feedback from a smaller group but sometimes you also wanted it from individuals that's that's good yeah you know it's no, funny I, unless you mentioned university because as you both know i teach at the uh, university as well and and i love the fact that you were in a progressive environment because i teach and i won't name the university but i think this is conducive to a lot of universities um I always say to students, you know, the university environment is not conducive to learning. <laughs> so, yeah. to, to, to that's true. You've done in your in your role, and I also, you know, I was lucky. I also had a fantastic relationship with them, um, with my students. Um, what part of it? Uh, I remember one year we had a guy in the class uh, in in the higher national class who was blind, and so he had his guide dog with him. And his guide dog was called Bomber or Bouncer. And he used to sit on the front, have he sit on the seat with his paws up <laughs> on the on the desk. And if if apparently if I got too boring, um the the, the students would send Bomber out to lie in front of me <laughs> on his back. <laughs> uh, that's funny. And ask me his tummy tickled. And certainly, you know, I was I also was diagnosed with cancer when I was when I was teaching, and the students were incredible. Um, when I had to tell them that I was going to be off for a considerable length of time, <coughs> they had actually heard about it from somebody else, and they arrived in with this absolutely huge bouquet of flowers, just enormous bouquet of flowers, because they just said, how are we going to cope without you? Hmm. How are we going to cope without you? That's nice. That's really nice. Yeah, I, see, I, nice was, I just had a very, very to... good relationship with my yeah. with my learners. <laughs> very good. Well, you know, we are, believe it or not, we've been on for about 40 minutes and we are out of time. Wow. But Ajay, no. we'd love to, to have you come back maybe in a couple of weeks if you're available uh, or sure. three weeks. I, you know, Rick, I, you know, I'd do anything for you, Leslie, so at any point in time. Because uh, I mean, we're just I, starting on this, and, I, and I, I really wanted to get into your lean learning, because that, that's, I think, a really important topic today. And so maybe next time we can talk about lean. 
Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that with any time. Uh, we'll 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 schedule you. Uh, I think we have one, two, maybe three weeks. In about three weeks, sure. We'll send you. We'll send you an invite if you can make it. That'd be great. Because uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on and, and and just share. You know, if you had before we end the show, if you had to give one bit of advice for somebody in in the L and D world that would help make them better at what they do, what would that be? Become business literate. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And yep. and, I, I, and, and I said the word literate uh, on purpose. Okay. Because I don't, you're not, you're hired as a subject expert in learning. Okay. So you're not yep. supposed to be a business expert. They hire people for that. They hire people to be mechanical and finance and so forth and marketing. You're not that. You're the learning expert. You need to understand how business operates. Mm-hmm. And what I really, if I can just say a last word here, what I really get discouraged about with a lot of the certifications that are out there in L&D is that they pay either lips, either they don't have it or they pay lip service to the business part of things. And to me, that's a lost opportunity to build credibility. And if I were anybody, and remember what an MBA program was created for, it was for engineers, right, to become, be promoted as managers mm-hmm. and directors. So they have to learn the business concept. So go do an MBA. I'm not saying do an MBA, but find just something that, make you better at understanding what how the business operates period and yeah my advice would be that learning should actually be at the front end of it should be an operational role yep. it shouldn't yep. sit behind uh, human resources right. it should be it should be operational and, and, i'll take your and ideas it, further leslie i've been promoting this for a while in my articles is that Stop being reactive, start being proactive. Get out of your cubicle in your office and go meet and have coffee, lunch with the operational people. Learn about what performance you're under and help them solve it, period, to your point. Yep. yep, good points. Well, that's the end of our show today. We'll be back next week with another one. I think we have Josh Cavalier on next week, and it should be fun What's to see Josh? what he's talking Josh? about. You know Josh, I think. Um, yes, I do. And... Um, and then the following week, we have uh, Batu Krishnan, who is going to talk about blockchain for certifications and registration and things. That'll be very interesting. Blockchain is yeah. becoming more and more popular in, in so many different areas. And we're not really using it like we can yet. Give it time. The banks are using it a lot and other people are, but it's not totally out there. It'll be interesting. And uh, Ajay, again, thanks for coming on. We always appreciate having you here. And one of these days, we'll have another dinner together when, when, when mm-hmm. the world goes back to normal, if ever, I hope. Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, thank you again to both. Pleasure to be here, your, both your company, and we appreciate it. Uh, our pleasure. Say hi to okay. Terry for us. And, um, and we'll see you folks next week on eLearn Chat. If you like the show, subscribe, give us feedback, and um, and. Keep showing up. And I hope you enjoy the LinkedIn live sessions. That's what we've been doing lately. We're also going live on Facebook, but we're trying LinkedIn. And so far, we're getting quite a few views on LinkedIn. People seem interested. So join the conversation with us. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.